I, I can't. I can't figure how y'all could have done that. Yeah. It's the thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song to praise him all day long. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way, take hold of it today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Good morning. Good to be at Berea this morning, isn't it? Awesome, awesome. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning before we get back into our uh, worship service, our song service with Brady. Youth group, please keep in mind that uh, I was talking to Braden this morning. He wanted me to make sure you guys understood that this Tuesday, TNT, weather permitting, will be happening at Cedars of Lebanon. So uh, stay tuned on that. If something happens and it storms bad, you'll readjust, right, Braden? Figure it out. Okay. Uh, summer T-shirts. They're uh, uh, if you if you said you wanted one, I think they're in. No, they're not in, but they're coming. Okay. Ten dollars for those. If you happen to not get one and you want one, I think there's a few extras. So just talk to Braden about that, and those are ten dollars each. Um, also, if you're getting, if anybody has any old couches or large rugs that uh, you just don't need, see Braden about that too. Uh, that possibly might donate those to the the big youth group for this summer. Okay. Vacation Bible School coming up July 19th through the 20th. Uh, if you want to help with that, please make sure you see one of the elders, one of the deacons. They can use all the help uh, we, we can use during that. It's July 19th through the 22nd, pending. Hopefully that's going to happen. We're pretty sure we're going to be able to make that happen. Okay. A um, couple of other things. This one is personal. Okay. My daughter, Jordan Burton, is marrying Mr. Gene Carmen. See him right there? Wave, y'all wave. See him? Yeah, see, there they are right there. Now listen, it's in the bulletin, it's all about it. I'm gonna tell you right now, they got everything they need, okay? So they don't need any more Publix cards, Target, but they got more than they need. So from now on, whatever, if you haven't given, just make it out to Terry and Renee Burton, okay? <laughs> and, and we'll make sure and take care of that. Okay, now, y'all are good with that, right, Gene, Jordan? Okay, yeah. All right, uh, last thing, guys, prayer request. If you have them, I'm teasing about that too, but two weeks away, less than, less than two weeks away, I'll have a new son-in-law, so here we go. Um, prayer request. If anyone has any prayer requests today, through the week, whenever, please uh, see one of the elders, and uh, they will take care of that for you uh, and, and, and get those prayers up that, that's, that, that we all need. And uh, if you grab one of the bulletins, uh, all of our elders are listed on the front of that bulletin right there, so uh, that, that'll get it. And one last thing, if you are visiting with us today, man, you are our honored guest, and we're so glad you're here. So uh, don't leave without us letting, letting us say hello, shake your hand, and uh, we just welcome you here and hope you come back to see us again. All right? I don't know if any of y'all noticed a difference in our first song, but I want to give a special thank you to 
uh, Donnie Bain and Lee Mangrum, and I think Ronnie Gerald was involved, and in, I don't know who else, but uh, we've got fresh new ceiling tiles in the auditorium, and this place is hot. It is live, and man, the singing, that first song was fantastic. I hope that y'all will be encouraged, because it sure did encourage me. But our next song is going to be number 707, To Christ Be True. Please stand as we sing. Mm -hmm. To Christ be loyal and be true. Scripture by Matt Vaughn, and then in our opening prayer by Mike Flanagan.
If you'd like to follow along with me, I'll be reading from Titus 3, 3 through 7. Titus 3, 3 through 7. <clears throat> Once we, too, were foolish and disobedient, we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God, our Savior, revealed His kindness and love, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we would inherit eternal life. So bow with me in prayer. <clears throat> Kind and merciful Father in heaven, we humbly approach your throne. Father, we are thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day. And we are thankful, Father, to be able to assemble together as believers, as brothers and sisters, and as those who have named Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Father, we praise you as the one and only true and living God. And we thank you, Father, that even before the beginning of time, you loved us and set in motion a plan of redemption. And we're so thankful for your asking Jesus to leave his heavenly home, come into this world, to live as a man and be human in every way. To be tempted in every way and yet to remain sinless. That he might be the perfect sin sacrifice for all the sins of the world. In the past, today, and in the future. And Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your willingness to go to the cross. To pour out your life's blood that we might have everlasting life. And we thank you that you have risen to the right hand of the Father and intercede on our behalf. We pray today that you will accept our humble thanks for every blessing you've bestowed upon us. Blessings in this world, our homes, our clothing, our food, all of our comforts, our work, our families and friends and loved ones. We praise you and we thank you. And we thank you for blessing us with all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms through the blood of Jesus. We pray that you'll bless our worship today. We pray that you will be with Lee as he brings a message and we're thankful for his abilities. We pray you continue blessing upon him. 
We pray you'll continue to bless Brady as he leads us in songs of praise. It's our prayer that all that we say and do will be good and acceptable in your sight. We pray your blessing upon the congregation of the Lord that meets here at Berea. Bless the elders and deacons, ministers, teachers, and every person in this flock that we have good and tender hearts and that we extend mercy to one another and that we strive to do what you would have us to do to your honor and glory. Father, we have many on our sick list. We pray your very special blessing on each one. Be with our doctors, nurses, caregivers, family members, but most of all, cover them with your healing hand. And Father, we just pray for their recovery and their return to their normal walks of life. Father, we are mindful today of Penny Williams and the loss of her brother, John Bilbrey, we pray your blessing upon that good family. Lift them up, give them comfort, healing, and peace. Father, our nation is divided and struggling. We pray for peace. We pray for wisdom. We pray for courage to do what's right. We pray for our leaders at the national, state, and local levels that you bless them, Father, give them courage. Bless us to support them. Father, we're mindful that there are many lost even here today. We pray that they will have good and tender hearts that they be receptive to the good news of Jesus and even this morning that they might name him as their personal savior in the waters of baptism. Father, we are blessed with many young people. We pray your special blessing upon them. Be with those that are Getting ready to graduate, bless them in the decisions they make in the days and weeks ahead. We pray that you'll open doors of opportunity for them. Uh, we pray, Father, for our older people. We're thankful to see so many here today. That you will bless them, that they will share their wisdom and understanding. And uh, we just are thankful that we have been blessed with young and old. Father, be merciful to us. We sin daily. We do and say and think things contrary to your will. We pray that you'll always see us through the blood of Jesus and that when our work here is done, that you'll bring us home to be with you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Next song this morning is Faithful Love. <laughs> Faithful.
Thanks again, Brady. Y'all think the tiles made a difference? I think it did. Either that or you're just singing, singing louder. Braden, if you want some couches, come down my road. Um, <laughs> there's, I can think of three right now. If you get the dogs off of them, there's some quality, <laughs> quality items. Isn't that what uh, Cousin Eddie said? It's a quality item, Clark. How much it set you back? And to the newlyweds, um, if you have everything, bless your heart. When you were talking about that, Terry, I was thinking about when Cindy and I got married. We were just too stupid to realize how poor we really were. We had, uh, this is how bad it was. We had one car and it was a 78 Pinto. And uh, we lived upstairs on University Avenue. There was a big house that the Braggs owned and it was divided up into four apartments and we lived in the upstairs of that. To, that we shared a bathroom with the apartment next door. It was a big, one of the big cast iron toes with a big claw feet, which was pretty cool. But you had to wait in line. To, you had to wait in line to use it. But anyway, I hope you have everything um, that your heart desires. Uh, I want us to look for a little while. Hey, Chris, back here in the sound booth. I still got to stay here. I can move around. No, I don't have a mic. Okay, well I'll start. I appreciate Mike's um, prayer this morning. Um, for the next few minutes this morning, I want us to look at some passages in James. And the reason I'm doing this lesson, I don't normally um, build my sermons around current events. I just, um, I think the church and the people um, of God need to be above current events. But some of the stuff that's been happening just in the last week, couple of weeks, even a couple of months, um, I think we need to look at, at the scripture in light of some of these events. Now, as we look at these scriptures today, what I'd like for you to do, I'm not going to lead you in any particular direction, but as we read these scriptures, I want you to think about these scriptures in light of some of the current events that we are seeing and hearing about. The reason I think it's important today for me to have a lesson like this, we're not of the world, that's true. Our citizenship is in heaven, that is true. But we live here in this world. And sometimes it feels like we're immersed up to our eyeballs in it. If you're not real careful, the world starts slowly eroding on our, on our faith and on our perception of things, and even our perception of right and wrong and what's good or what's bad. Um, let's face it, right now, these are, these are troubling times. Uh, they're troubling times for our country, and they're troubling times for our church. As a church and as a country every now and then, we need to step back and take a look at ourselves. It's a fact. You know, self-examination is a scriptural principle. Our Lord makes it very plain that every now and then, Lee, you need to take, take a look at yourself and see where you stand in light of right and wrong, good and evil, God's word, how you're treating your fellow man. It's important for us to do it because if you don't do that, what you end up doing, you drift so far off the mark and if you don't ever look at yourself in light of scriptural context, then you miss the boat. We don't want to do that. So as we look at some of these passages today, and there's a whole lot of other ones. In fact, some of these passages... Um, you will recognize from a lesson I had about a month ago, if you remember it. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. We're going to look at some more, and some of these will be, will be familiar, I hope. Um, and the first one I want us to take a peek at is James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. James says here, and again, I love James because the whole book uh, and all the passages, uh, they, they're, they're like standalone passages. They have... One verse will have, a, will have a spiritual absolute there that you can always take to the bank. Always. Uh, they're so profound. And the other thing I like about James, it's true about the whole Bible, but in James in particular, there are so many practical applications, whether it's first century Christians or 21st century Christians, that you can take to the bank every, every time. We'll start with verse 16 of chapter 1. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. Paul talks about good and perfect gifts too in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In fact, the last verse of chapter 12, Paul talks about, he's been addressing spiritual gifts, but he talks about, um, I'm going to show you now a more perfect or a more excellent way. And that's the latter part of chapter 12. And then I don't think it's an accident because the chapters and verses were, were added way later. That he, he goes into talking about love, 
faith, hope, and love. Um, all three of those things are in very, very short supply today. Very short supply. And here's the deal, y'all, and the reason I want us to do this lesson. If we don't show it, if the world doesn't, don't see these qualities in us, where are they going to see it? Where? There is nowhere else. He talks about good and perfect gifts. Um, I think about, aside from the spiritual gifts and the faith, hope, and love, think about these things. I do. Um, how perfect and how good is just having family? I mean, really. Some of us have lost family members. I think about Penny. Um, there's a young woman that Cindy knows um, who has, um, has got COVID. She just had a baby. Um, she's in the hospital now on a respirator. She's maybe in her late 20s. And um, her husband now, I don't know, maybe I, I, I hope and pray that, that she makes it. But he's looking at the prospect of having to raise a newborn with some other. You think about that. How, how important is that? How valuable is that? Uh, sometimes we, we take our family for granted. Um, there's a, um, for some of you who listen to Americana music like I do, there's a Paul Thorne song. I know Donnie does. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> what is it? Sometimes I don't love, I don't uh, like some of the folks in my family I love. I don't like most of the folks I love. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's dangerous to fall in the trap of taking each other for granted. But these are things that are good and perfect. Having friends. How about this, y'all? How about us being able to come here this morning and sing just a minute ago? Amen. Good and perfect gift? Yeah, it really is. Uh, those are some of the things, too. Faith, hope, and love. Eternal salvation one day. But there's so many things that we're given right here in the here and now. Um, Cindy and, and, uh, and uh, I and Tucker... Uh, we're going to go camping tomorrow. Small thing. But I like to camp. Do a little fishing. How many of y'all like to fish? To me, good and perfect gift. Um, those things we need to think about. And then he says, these things come down from the Father of lights. And, uh, and I, again, I go back to my, my childhood days of King James. Um, talks about God. There's no variableness. There's no shadow of turning. There's no shadow with him. It's troubling to me sometimes to see folks in the religious world, especially in Christianity in particular, try to change God and the message of God. Let me say it this way. I don't know, it, this is just me. Um, and and I, I take it that folks like to do that because they find some kind of comfort in it. But I, I, this is my position on it. I'm just the opposite of that. In a world that's constantly changing all the time, it doesn't make any difference if it's politically or spiritually. Or it's just constantly changing. I take comfort in the fact of knowing that I worship a God who never changes. Never changes. He, he's always the same. And you'll hear people say, oh, no, no, the God of the New Testament's different from the God of the Old Testament. No, he's not. No, he's not. Just because justice delayed is not justice tonight. God will make things right. You can be sure of that. Um, he's not willing that any should perish. He's always loved his people. But one of the things I take comfort in is what James says here. He's sending you good and he's sending you perfect gifts. And Lee, you know something? He never changes. He's not going to give you something and then later on give you a good and perfect gift and say, whoop, I'm going to take that away from you. You might lose it. You might give it up. But he's not going to take it away from you because he doesn't change. He's always, he's always the same. Christians should take comfort in that. Next, in James 127, and I know I've had this one, this passage. Again, one of my favorites. Uh, religion that our religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. How many of y'all would like to think of yourself as being pure and faultless? Pure and faultless, um, pure and undefiled. I think the King James renders that. Is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world? There are passages in the Old Testament that are almost direct quotes from that. One in Isaiah, two in Psalms. They're almost direct quotes. So again, God has not changed. Take care of those who can't take care of themselves. Uh, I have been, I've had the privilege to sit in some of our elders' meetings in the last two or three months, and I can tell you this. Um, they're just men, and they have faults like everybody else, but I can, I can assure you of this. If you're a member of the flock here at Berea, they take this passage extremely seriously. If they think there are people here that are suffering, that can't help themselves, they will make sure that you're helped. Now, they're not mind readers. They don't know everything unless that's expressed to them. 
I'm going to tell you, you've got a group of men here who take this extremely seriously. But then he goes so far, and again, I've had this passage before, so I don't want to dwell on it to him, but then he says to keep yourself unpolluted from the world or unspotted from the world. There's the trick. Now, a lot of us, the helping folks, most people have good hearts. They're willing to do that. But how do you keep yourself unpolluted or unspotted from the world around you? This is kind of to young folks, maybe old folks. I can remember, <laughs> it's been a long time ago, but as I was coming up in, uh, in the building trades and I was an apprentice, uh, there was a tremendous force ex <laughs> exerted against me from, from people that I looked up to that, were, that I was working with, but they weren't exactly the most moral and righteous fellows around. Some of you may have a workplace like that. Um, the airport, even in Maine, it wasn't a whole lot better. But I found myself over time, um, those people, would, they would influence me a great deal. I, I've told some of you the story once before. There was an older gentleman that I worked with, and I was probably a second or third year apprentice. And every day, instead of sitting around and play cards and tell stories, he would go and he'd read his Bible. Well, I found out later on, this, this man was a member of the Lord's Church. And we were, we were discussing the matter, and, and, and I... I just threw it out there that I was a member of the Lord's Church too. And he looked at me and he said, really? He's like, ouch. Uh, you can have people influence you badly. It, it, it's, a, it's a progression of things. I think about some of the things I did. I'll share one thing um, just to try to fit in. We were working, they were building, this is how long ago this has been, a J.C. Penney at Hickory Hollis. How long has that been? Uh, there was a young man that was a traveler, and he was up here from, from Florida working. He was a good guy. But for some reason one day, me and another boy, I don't even remember his name. We called him Snoots, so you just write your own biography about him. We called me and Snoots one day. Snoots decided that this young man would uh, bring in a sausage and egg sandwich every morning. That's what he had for break. Snoots said, hey, let's do something to James' sandwich. So we did. There's, there's a wire pulling lubricant called Yellow 77. Some of you that are wiremen out there, you know what I'm talking about, or you've seen it. And um, so we went and put some Yellow 77 on this poor boy sandwich. We thought it was funny. This is to the young folks. Listen to me now. Funny, funny. No. Came time for break. This boy sits down. He takes a bite out of his sandwich. Of course, immediately he knows that somebody's done something with it. So he puts the sandwich down. We're all sitting around in a circle. He goes over the game box, and he picks up a wire hickey. For those of you who know, it's a pipe with a, that you've been conduit with. It's got a hickey on a little bender on the end. It's a piece of steel pipe. He got that pipe out, and he walked around. We was all sitting in a circle, and he was tapping it on the floor, looking at us. So I'd already done one thing wrong, and he was asking anybody who was man enough to do that to own up to it. I was about the third or fourth in line. He came up to me, and he asked me, and you know what I said? Nope. <laughs> Shouldn't have done it. Next progression, lied about it. Uh, it. Sin has a tendency to lead us down a, uh, I never did own up to it. You know, I hope, I hope I've gotten forgiveness for that. You know, later on, you know, we were working side by side and I had to act like, you know, and he talked about it a long time. The point I'm trying to make is keeping yourself unpolluted from the world, whether you're a young person or old, it's, it's hard to do. Worse than that, you know, get in the workplace, you know, and things are going on that you know are lies or you're, or you're knowing that are, are dishonest in your workplace. Maybe your boss is even a person that practices that and trying to push that on you. You know, finally you've got, to, you've got to reach a point if you know that it's wrong, and again, contemporary now, if you know it's wrong, then stop doing it. If you know something's wrong, that somebody's doing and you've got a chance to stop it, then stop it. We're going to talk about that in just a minute, too. Uh, let's turn the page over. And this is uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Now, and again, for the sake of, of um, time this morning, chapter 2 starts out with, I'm just going to give you a list a little bit, about being, showing favoritism or, or partiality. That's where it ends. That's where he starts it. Now he's down toward the tail end of chapter 2, or middle part of it, and he says in verse 12, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Something that we've got to understand 
in the Lord's church and even in the world today. There is judgment, but there's one righteous judge. Uh, mercy is one of those qualities that's not shown a lot today either. Just not, just not shown. Uh, James makes it pretty plain here, though, that if you're, and this is just a reiteration of some of the same kind of teaching that Jesus had, his whole ministry. If you want to be harsh on your judgment, you want to be unmerciful, that's how you want to treat your fellow man, that's how you want to treat other folks, well, guess what? Then you're going to have judgment without mercy. I don't know about you, but on the last day when I'm standing before God the Father, I want all the mercy I can get. Amen? In order for me to get that, though, I've got to show mercy. I've got to be forgiving. I've got to forgive other people. It's hard to do, but if I'm, going to, if I'm going to acquire that type of forgiveness and that type of mercy, then that's one of the things I've got to give. And it's hard to do, especially when people seem to be bent on, on hurting us or maybe even hurting our family. That's even tougher. Somebody's doing something to your family and showing somebody mercy. Very difficult thing to do. Read on down with me just a little bit more, though, in verse 18. This is a connection... Because he's about to go into the tongue. But he starts out with deeds, what we do, and then he's going to go into tongues, what we say. What we do and what we say, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. What you do and what you say is who you are. And if you don't think words hurt, I'm going to tell you. Um, and, and, and you may be different from me, I don't know. But I, I have lived my life long enough to, to, to realize this. The hurts that have been caused me in my, in my life that have hurt me the worst have been words, have been things that people have said to me or said about me or done to me. I have been whipped many times. I have been punched in the nose and the eye and some of it rightfully so. But you know, those things heal up. I can think of some things right now that folks have said to me and about me and they still sore. It's still a sore spot. So what you say is very important. But he talks about first, he talks about what we do. He said, you show, me my, show your faith w without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the devils believe that and shudder. What we say, what we do. And it's very important that whatever we do say, whatever we do preach, that we do that. Uh, members of the Lord's Church, listen. We're here today, and we're worshiping, and that's great. But when we leave out of here, and we go out into the workplace or school or whatever else, if people see us doing something that's just the opposite of what we've been preaching, bad, real bad. You know, there are a lot of things that Jesus condemns, um, even his own people and, and the scribes and the Pharisees. But the one thing that he mentions over and over and over again is hypocrisy. If you say one thing and you do something else, you're a hypocrite. And, and the church takes a terrible black eye for it. There have been times, and I know I've talked to some of you, when I've gone out and talked to somebody about the, about the church, even at work, and if, if they've ever had an encounter with somebody in the Lord's church that had, had left a negative or a, a, a bad taste in their mouth, it's the first thing they bring up. It's the first thing they bring up. Why would I want to go down there and worship you? So-and-so worships down there, and guess what he did to me? Ouch. It's hard to get around that. So... Some people may use that as an excuse, but don't give them that excuse. Uh, let me make sure I didn't skip over that. James chapter 3, uh, in verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. This is so important, y'all. And again, as I read these, try to think about where we are now as a church and where we are now as a country. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man. Let me read that again. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's perfect. Able to keep his whole body in check. How important is what we say? James says that if you can control your tongue, you're perfect. You're complete. And you're also capable of keeping your whole body in check. Everything else follows. What you say is important. There have been so many times in my life, I said before, there are things that have been said to me that still are sore and smart sometimes. Um, the other side of that is, I have said some things that I sure wished I could unsay. I sure wished I could. Um, I have said them to family members. I've said them to members of the Lord's Church. And sometimes they were just wholly inappropriate and meant to be hurtful. How many of y'all, don't have to show of hands, how many of y'all have... 
in, in a battle of words have deliberately said something to try to hurt somebody. You weren't trying necessarily to win an argument or make a point. All you were trying to do was hurt somebody. You ever done that? And it does hurt. Let me ask you this. As far as people saying, if an enemy says something to you, and they've already proven themselves to be an enemy, that's hurtful, does that surprise you a whole lot? How about somebody, though, that you love and you care for? A friend, a family member, somebody that you, you're close by. All of this, David talks about this numerous times. And I think about our Lord, too. You take somebody that's close to you. Think of as a brother, a friend. And before you know it, they're saying something to you or about you. How bad does that hurt? That's what James is talking about here. He goes on to describe it as a fire. Once it gets started, you can't put it out. Um, the two young men, uh, I think there was two young men that started the fire up in the Smokies. I think it was like one little match or fire. I like to burnt the whole, whole countryside down. That's how the tongue works. Jesus mentions over and over again, the Apostle Paul does too, all of the sins that are mentioned in, in works of the flesh that are just, you know, oh, that's terrible, the murder. And but he always mentions gossip and backbiting. It will absolutely destroy any organization. The church is not different. Neither is our nation. Words are important. If you put something out there and you say it, as Christians, we're supposed to be measured with a measure of salt. Everything that we say is supposed to be measured. Against... If you put something out there and you know that it's not factual and you know that it's a lie, but you put it out there anyway, it's a sin. And it's a bad sin. Because here's the deal about the words. Those words are put out there and they're gobbled up by people. And guess what those people do? They reiterate the same words again, over and over again. It's the fire that he's talking about. It takes hold, and it has nothing to do with facts, and it has nothing to do with making people feel better. It has everything to do with the father of lies. The devil is a liar and the father of lies. And anybody who participates in that, everybody tells fibs, I do. You do too. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. What I'm talking about here, and what I think he's talking about here, is a deliberate attempt to deceive and mislead people for either financial or political gain. And let me tell you something, folks. Let me tell you, there's a lot of sins that we can stand up here in the pulpit and condemn and talk about. But if we don't start talking about that one more, the, the church in this country is going to go down the tubes. I'm telling you. That's how it starts. And this is not so. This has happened before. This is not a new thing. This has happened down through history. People being misled. Whole nations taking down the tubes. You've got to get right with it. James says here, the tongue is a deadly fire. And again, whether we as individuals, as a group of people, are able to tame that tongue and use it as we should, um, we'll never aspire to be perfect or complete. Go on a little bit further. Turn your page on verse 16. And as I read this one again, keep in your mind, think about this. I've seen this personally. I've seen it at work. I've seen it in government. I've seen it in the Lord's church. This is one of those spiritual absolute passages. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. That is a spiritual absolute. They all go hand in hand. If you have envy and you have selfish ambition, you will see with your own eyes disorder in every evil practice. That's not least speaking, that's the Bible. So, if you see a place that's disorderly and there's evil practices going on, what does James say is the root cause of it? Evil and selfish ambition. You know, think about this. The envy and the selfish ambition is what made the devil the devil. You know, the devil, Satan, has become our personification of evil. But think about this for a moment. Who caused him to sin? Well, anybody. This is the original sin. You know, we talk about Cain, and I'd even, I've even had a lesson on it. You know, the first sin was murder. No, it was not. That's not the first sin. The first sin was Cain's envious thoughts about his brother that caused him to murder. Envy was the first one. You know what caused the devil the first? Envy and pride. Those are the first ones. We never talk about them. We never talk about it. You know the reason that mankind is in the situation we're in right now and require the blood of Jesus Christ for forgiveness? Envy and pride. That's it. It, it took the devil down his road and it'll take us down our road. But you just don't hear about it. Now, you'll hear a lot of other things preached on, but you won't hear about this. He says very plainly, 
If you see these things, if you see disorder, anybody see disorder in our country right now? I do. You see any of these things that James is talking about here? The absolute here is, then there's envy and there's selfish ambition. Take it to the bank. All right, got to hurry up. Uh, James 4, let's turn our Bibles over. James 4 and verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I love that song. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humility is another one of those qualities that's sadly missing in the world today. There is no humility. And again, if the world is going to see humility in people, a trait that Jesus Christ, think about this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, as humble as he was, if anybody had a right, in fact, the devil appealed to that pride when he tempted Jesus. But he was too humble to buy into that. We're going to buy into that. In fact, every time that the Pharisees and the Jews would ask him about his godship or his, his divinity, he'd just kind of defer about it. Eh, well, you know, God's the Father and I'm... He, Jesus! He would do that. What does that say about me? How humble should I be? If the Son of God and the Creator of the universe could do that, I might ought to think about it myself. The world is not going to see this characteristic if, he doesn't, if they don't see it in us. And then he says... Humble yourselves before the Lord, and guess what? He'll lift you up. It'll be okay. You don't have to brag on yourself. You, if you live a Christian life, and you're humble, and you take care of folks, and you fulfill some of the other things that we just read about here, God will lift you up. He'll lift you up. Don't worry about that. Don't lift yourself up. God will lift you up. That's our, that should be our, our attitude. Uh, if you go on over to verse 17, and I know I've had this one lately, uh, anyone then who knows to do good knows to do the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it, sin. There's a proverb, I think it's chapter 3, 25, 27, somewhere in there about. Solomon says there that do not, if you're, if you're able, do not withhold good from whom it is due when it is within your power to give it. If you know there are things that you can do for somebody, whether the world or whoever else thinks it's good or not, if, but if you know it's something you should be able to do and you're capable of giving it, then do it. If you're, if you're in a position of power of any kind and you can do something, do it. James says it. If you know to do good, he carries it a step further, and you don't do good. It's sin. I think about some of the things in my life and opportunities that I have let pass, and it was a sin. I had an opportunity to do it. I had the power to do it. And I withheld good for whatever reason. I was either too busy or, or too prideful or whatever, and I didn't do it. James says that it's sin. And finally, that must be my glasses. I know the, the, the video is fuzzy, but even the clock's fuzzy to me. Sorry. I want to finish up uh, in verse 16 of chapter 5. And again... It's, it's just so important because it's a statement of humility. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Or the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He even goes into Elijah's story here about the, the drought from Old Testament. I go back to good and perfect gifts where we started. And again, I don't think we take... I don't think we appreciate this like we should. How good and perfect is it for us today as Christians to be able to pray for each other? If you were to rate it, other than eternal salvation in the afterlife in heaven one day, as far as being in this life, where we are right now, can you think of anything that's more important than for us to be able to pray for each other? And we do it. We do it. I, I know we do it at home and places. But do you think... By what he's saying here, confess in your faults one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. Um, I've seen it here. I've, I've come forward here before too. For those of you, if you can think back to a time maybe you have responded publicly and asked for prayers. Have you ever had something going on in your life that's so bad, and um, I think about some of Paul's writing too, where you have let your, your spiritual ship has, has run aground so bad that you, you don't even feel like your prayers are being heard anymore. And um, so you can ask other people to pray, and you ask for the Spirit of God to intercede for you. And, and Paul talks about with groanings that, 
that cannot even, cannot even be uttered. You can't even understand yourself sometimes. I can think of times I've come forward here, and after um, one of the elders or somebody would have a prayer, you ever felt like you just had everything just lifted, lifted up off of you before? If you've never felt that, I'm sorry. Here's the deal, y'all. Prayer does the same thing for Christians that baptism does for non-Christians. Does that make sense? You know, in baptism, all your sins are washed away. You're raised a new creature. But after you become that new creature, and we all know that we're going we're gonna to keep doing wrong, what, what continually cleanses us from that? How do you get that in? How do you access that? You do it through prayer. So for God's people to minimize the importance of prayer, especially after the baptism fact, terrible disservice to us. It really is. Prayer is that thing that makes us appear to be whole. But if you've reached a point in your spiritual life that you're down so far that you don't even feel like your prayers are being answered, who do you go to? I'm telling you, again, it goes back to God never changing. It is a blessing that we don't take advantage of like we should. If we did, if we did, I really feel like there'd be a whole lot less grief and heartache in the Lord's church. I think it's very important for us to do that. I have felt that. I have felt that being, being lifted off of me before. The invitation's extended to you this morning. And maybe there's something, there's a burden on you uh, that you'd like to have lifted. Um, maybe it's a first-time gospel obedience, or maybe you remember the Lord's church, and you're, there's just some things that you need some prayers for. Um, James makes it pretty plain here in one of these spiritual absolute passages that if, you're, if you will confess your thoughts and you'll pray for one another, you can be healed. If you need to respond, do so now as Brady leads us in a song. If you came in this morning, you should have picked up a uh, communion packet. If you did not, please raise your hand and Ronnie is in the back and he will come down and bring one for you. For those of you who have not been here, there's a little film that's on the very top. You can peel that back to get to the body of Christ and below that would be, you can peel that back the appropriate time to get to the blood of Christ. Afterwards, when uh, we are finished, if you will please hold, just hold them in your hand. And then as we dismiss out the back, there are some garbage cans and please place those in the garbage cans on your way out.
morning I've been asked to direct our minds as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. I'll do so by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you would please now, prepare our minds to partake of the bread. Bow with me. Father and our God, we humble ourselves this morning as we approach thy throne. Father, we are truly blessed to have this day, Father, that you have given us. Father, at this time, Lord, we approach thy throne and come before thee, Father, to proclaim that we are remembering, Father, that Jesus the Christ died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And at this time, Lord, we partake of this bread that represents his body that was beaten and broken for our sins. And Father, we pray that we do so in a manner that would be uh, pleasing, Father, in thy sight. And Father, we pray that you will continually forgive us for the many sins that we commit because Jesus paid the perfect sacrifice for those sins. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Is everyone ready for the cup? If you would please bow with me. Father, in like manner, we again approach thy throne. Father, grateful for this cup, Father, which to us represents the blood of Christ, Father, that flowed from his body that was freely given for the purpose of washing us free of our sins, Father. Father, help us to partake of this this fruit of the vine, Father, that, that to us represents Jesus' blood in a manner, Lord, that would be pleasing in thy sight. Father, help us to always remember as we partake of this cup, Lord, that without the, the blood of Christ, Father, we, we cannot be forgiven for our sins. And that as we do this, we remember his great sacrifice for us. And that, Father, he continually washes us free with his blood today. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. 